Now I'm taking on the challenging task of talking about preparing an adaptation plan in 15 minutes. Um, but um, then there is a lot of detailed guidance in Coast Adapt about preparing a plan. You need to read that material. I won't have time to go through it all now. So I'll try and draw out some of the things that are important. Right from the front, having good framing for your adaptation plan, very clear objectives and a vision are essential components. We'll talk a bit about that in step one, um, but they are really important and they really help you to work out who should be involved both internally and externally in your organisations or beyond, the scale at which you should be um, dealing with the issue and the role of the plan right from the word go, whether it's a strategic plan, whether it's an operational plan or even in some cases whether it's a specific project that you're undertaking. You can get guidance for all of those through this framework of CCADS. Um, and the important thing I wanted to draw out earlier on, and again I'll reiterate it, is leadership and support within your organisation are crucial to getting your adaptation plan through effectively. So this is the CCADS framework. Um, it's a risk-based framework, something that most people who've done any form of coastal zone management and looked at the guidance that comes from state governments and looked at good practice from beyond Australia will be familiar with. It goes through a series of six steps in this case. Some of these frameworks have eight steps, some four. It doesn't matter how many steps there are. What's important is stepping through the process. And as I um, will reiterate again, you can go and enter this process at the stage you are at in your own planning. We're not saying start again from scratch. We recommend trying to assess your existing plans that you might have and build on them where possible. And in some cases, you may well need to start again. The thing I also want you to notice here is the number of opportunities you have to change and learn from what you've done and start again or make um, slight differences right from at each step. So we don't um, say go through the whole cycle and then start again. In some cases, you might go to the next step and decide that you need to change your direction again and it allows you to go to the front and start from, from, from the beginning again. When you're using CCADS, we take what we call a scan, plan and delve deeper approach. The scan is really familiarising yourself with what's in the whole of the CCADS framework. If you just go to step one and start doing it, you might waste some time and you might um, not know where you're going to next. So it's quite useful, even if you're using the, the, the sort of, um, I guess, wader content, the dot points at the top, to familiar, familiarise yourself with what you need in each section, it's quite important. The planning cycle is when you go through and you actually start to work through the CCADS framework and you, you're building up your adaptation plan. And the delve deeper component is really for those people who have identified a specific challenge that they've done, they've, they've go into a much deeper risk assessment approach and they then need to do some more detailed engineering or social work to get something happening. Um, and those are the, th <coughs> excuse me, the three levels. CCADS should never just be done once. It's intended to be used and reiterate over time, a number of different cycles that allow you to learn from what you've done before. The important thing here is learning from what you've done before. Adaptation is new, it's complex, it's difficult, and changes will need to be made. We need to set up processes that we learn from what we've done and build on that as we go forward. So, step one of CCADS, identifying challenges. I like to call this step really setting yourself up for success because at this stage you're determining the scope, the framing for your planning. I said it before, that's important, it is. It may be that you are, your particular area is affected by a large amount of sea level rise, inundation, or potentially affected by it. It may have flooding that encro um, encroaches onto areas beyond your actual control. So right from the word go, you need to be thinking about if that is the case, who do you deal with? Is a plan for your one council enough? Should you be having a plan that, co that, that covers a number of councils, a number of organisations? If your plan is only for your council but the issue is beyond, how do you set that up right from the word go that you engage effectively with your stakeholders beyond your area of remit so you get something useful happening? At this stage, it's also very important to identify the barriers that are there to your planning. They're generally going to be internal and perhaps some of your stakeholders are challenges. 
But identifying those barriers early on allows you to really set yourself up again for success because you can think about how you get over those barriers. Of course, you're going to set a vision and goals that are important for what you, know, you want to achieve from this process. And you then can start to understand the climate threats and opportunities that arise. And I do want to emphasize that opportunities because we often think about threats, which is a problem because it's negative discourse that we have with our communities and so on. If we can identify opportunities and ways in which we can benefit or make the most of our challenges and build on what we've got, that's important. Then it's important to undertake your first pass risk screening and based on the outcomes of that, you can start to use that information to get buy-in to act. Now this buy-in is critical within your organisation. Often the first steps are done by someone who's not high up in an organisation and to get that buy-in they need to work up through their own organisation and get the support that's required right from the outset. And that's where that leadership that again I emphasised earlier on is important, whether it's from the, the person that's highest up in the organisation or senior management, but that leadership is really important and helps to drive your adaptation planning through effectively. You can also get that buy-in or social licence, you might call it, from your external so stakeholders. And then you need to set up processes to actually undertake your planning. And this means establishing the roles that you have for adaptation within the organisation. Who's going to develop the plan? Who's responsible for this? What sort of governance do you need to set up? And we provide some guidance and some indication of that within, um, and, and how to do it within um, the CCADS framework and the rest of Coast Adapt. The next step is undertaking your risk assessments and determine the vulnerability that you face from climate change. This gives you that opportunity to really start to refine your priority interest, areas of interest. So you've done your first pass risk assessments, you know vaguely now where the challenges are going to be and you can really refine your, your, where you're going to put your effort into doing your second pass risk assessments. You then can undertake those second pass risk assessments and develop a, develop a risk register for your organisation or your area of interest. At this stage, you can even start to think about some of the priorities and the way that, and the timing that might be required for a response. If you have identified that you have, that your particular area has got no real challenges from climate change in the near future, you can really identify those now and start to make sense of it. And again, you then do stakeholder engagement communication based on what you've learned at this particular stage. Lots of inf information within CCADS and within the rest of Coast Adapt to help you work through this particular phase. Step three is when we start to think about what we're going to do about these risks. And we need to identify the options that are available to us. Now you can use a number of different ways of, of, of sourcing adaptation options. Some of these will fall directly out from your risk tables that you've identified. You can almost visualise what you need to do to get over a certain challenge. I think a very important um, I issue at this stage is working with your stakeholders to think about what they think is required to deal with the issue. They are the people who are going to be affected by it. It's great if they can come up with the solutions. Now, even if their solutions aren't selected in the end, their involvement will make a difference. And then the fact that their, their um, ideas are thought of is often very empowering for communities and gets them to, the really, to, to come up with innovative solutions. You can also build from others' ex experience. Um, so there's lots of lists of adaptation options that are becoming available. You can find those online, but within a Coast Adapt, we also provide a number of different um, tables with um, potential adaptation options. Um, and these can be used to identify what sorts of options might be available and then help people to, to think of other ones that might be um, uh, um, particular options for, the, for your issues that you face. You need to think about collating various bits of information about each option, the costs, how long it takes, what, um, what, what any risks might be and so on. And again, you can get um, details from that within CCADS. And you can start to think about some of the things um, that you have, like win-win situations, those sort of options that provide you immediate benefits versus those that are going to be um, more reactive to bigger climate change effects when they occur later on. 
and even thinking about some of the real challenging things for your communities, those transformational options that, that really are difficult, that mean very big changes to what they've got at the moment. An example of that might be relocating a community from some place where they've lived for a long, long time before. That is really, really challenging. And um, we need to think about those sort of um, steps early on because we need to recognize just how difficult they are to implement and how we need to get people involved for long periods of time before we do those. Of course, at this stage, we might have learned a whole lot of things and it might be necessary to go back to step one and think about reframing and passing through again and never forget those arrows that are in the, um, the CCAS framework. Step four is when we start to evaluate those options and start preparing a plan. So we need to, at this stage, establish the criteria that we're going to use to support our decision making. And that means identifying what level of risk is acceptable to our organisation, our communities and so on, and use those to start to, to stream out the, the adaptation options that we've identified. We can do some initial screening of options and we provide a number of, of questions to help you do that within the CCADS framework. Um, and then we, you need to start assessing the options you've identified. We have an information manual within Coast Adapt that provides some really great information about various tools that you can use to help you do this, such as multiple criteria analysis, cost-benefit analysis, and so on. It's important at this stage to really start thinking about how you can actually set up a sequence of solutions or an adaptation pathways and thinking about when the timing of actions, what's required to, before, to, to actually be done before you can implement an action, so those lead times. So you can think about when things can be done. I'll talk about this a bit in a, in a, in a second in a, great, in a bit more detail. And you can then start to develop your adaptation plans or your investment decisions and again be prepared to move back to other steps as required. Um, Importantly, at this stage of your planning too, as you start to develop a plan, you need to think about your indicators. Indicators that might be thresholds of when you should act, but indicators that, can, that you might use to look at the success or not of your adaptation options. And those will be very important when you go to the monitoring and evaluation phase, but should be incorporated in an adaptation plan. And you should also be thinking about how you can get your adaptation plan to be mainstreamed or to really become a driver within your organisation. And rather than sitting as a plan outside of everything else in your organisation, that it integrates everything that's going on because that way you can really drive things forward. So there's a lot of detail about adaptation planning that we haven't got time to go in now. What should be in a plan? It's important to think about integrated solutions. So those sort of solutions that can give multiple benefits to what you um, are trying to achieve from your adaptation plans. And often these will be the ones that are looked at favorably by your decision makers. So an example is if you um, have storm surge challenges, you might plant mangroves because there's some really good information showing that mangroves can dampen storm surge and really get um, some benefits that are natural as well without having to build a wall or do some things that are engineering intensive. Um, mangroves are important bird habitat, fish habitat, crab habitat, so they're important for biodiversity and they're also important for fish. So there might be an NRM plan or a fisheries management action that's, that, that, that's developed um, from doing this particular adaptation option. And the other thing is that more and more science is showing us that mangrove systems have, are very good at accumulating carbon and, um, and supporting that accumulation of carbon. So there's an emission reduction benefit. So you can see that with one particular set of actions, you can get a lot of outcomes, which is really important when you're starting to sell your ideas to people who want to put money into them. I talked briefly about adaptation pathways before. Um, this is really around sequencing your actions. So really deriving a map, once you've identified all your options and you start to work out what you should do first, what might be the most cost effective um, option that has win-win outcomes right away versus those that are more harder and challenging and perhaps more difficult that later on. And you might want to wait until you're really sure about what the effects of climate change are before you implement those options. Waiting for longer in some of these ways also allows for new innovative solutions to pop up and, um, and come up from your communities or from other people around the globe, and you can incorporate those. But it does require identifying thresholds at, when you, at, at which you determine when you're going to act and monitoring those thresholds. 
And that is important. It does take resources, but really important, you must do it. So an example might be if you had beach erosion, you might prevent erosion initially by stabilizing your dunes using revegetation methods. Over time, you might need to do some beach nourishment, which is a little bit more expensive, but, but can preserve your beach into, um, for longer periods of time. Ultimately, you might need a seawall. Now, that might, you might build a, a seawall of a particular height. It will cost quite a lot of money. And um, instead of uh, building that seawall to what the sea level rise might look like in um, 2100, you might build it towards what it might look like in 2050. But it's better to build a little bit of redundancy into that system so that if it's necessary at a later stage, that seawall can be raised rather than a new one being built from scratch. And of course, you might then ultimately, if sea level rise continues and you can't protect yourself from it with a wall, it might be worth relocating at some stage. So that might be a pathway that you could determine over time for that particular issue. Importantly, if you want to achieve outcomes from your plans, you need to think about who's responsible for various things. Your plan needs to link to other plans. You need to think about what resources are required. You need to monitor and you need to be able to reflect, react to trigger points. All your actions will have risks and limitations associated with them and it's worth identifying them and keeping them in your plan, identifying them clearly in your, in your adaptation plan. You should always think about the interaction of your adaptation options with other things that you need to manage or are managing within your area. So um, there are a range of different things going on. Think about how these interact with each other and do keep an eye on the performance indicators so that you can um, assess your, 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 your um, outcomes later on. You need to build a business case then to act and we provide a template within CCADS that can help you to do an effective business case. And um, we, um, by working through that, you can get some outcomes that are required. We provide a number of different things that you can see on the screen here that will help you to get your business case through. Things such as um, business case alone won't work. You need to possibly have your business case ready in once an event occurs, it's really useful time because that will help focus your, your, your decision makers on what you're trying to achieve. Again, it requires leadership to get a, um, a business case through and um, business case which shows that staged implementation of options is a very powerful thing because the people with the finances under their control will know that you're not trying to get them to spend money unnecessarily. Um, and again, things such as um, looking for opportunities also drive your, help drive your business case forward. Step five is when you take action. And again, here we look at barriers to action and look at ways in which we can overcome them. We really need to get stakeholder and community buy-in for the actions that we're going to do. Sometimes it's easy early on, but over time, as the options become more difficult and complex, it's really important to get that stakeholder and community buy-in. We need to think about how we're going to fund or finance the adaptation options that we've identified. Um, and we have a, a report that we developed um, and some guidance around um, adaptation finance um, that can start the journey um, within um, Coast Adapt. And we've also worked with the Investor Group on Climate Change who have brought out a report um, themselves that, can, that starts to bring the, the finance community um, into this adaptation space and can help move this forward. Partnerships are important, saves money, but also helps develop outcomes. And of course, we need to take decisions and implement those actions. The final step is monitoring and evaluation. Always looked as the final step, but often some of the most important steps. You need to develop an effective program. You need to monitor those trigger points and those indicators that we identify in our plan. And we also need to think about how we determine over time, not only the outputs, have we implemented something, but what are the outcomes? What are we achieving from this over time? We need to use that information to evaluate our plans and we need to use those evaluations to report back to our stakeholders and communities. There's a range of different tools for evaluation and, and we provide some of those within the guidance in CCADS and, and in Coast Adapt. And of course, this is only the next step to what you should be doing again and that's going through the cycle again, building on what you've learned before. So just to um, clarify, Remember those feedback loops. Adaptation is not simple. 
We will make mistakes. Let's learn from what we do. Keep detailed records of what's going on so, and what you've done so that others can learn from what you've done and build on that. Communicate and engage internally and externally continually. And monitor, evaluate and report back to your communities. So that's the adaptation planning in a nutshell. Um, you'll need to read a lot more on, on, on Coast Adapt and work through it more slowly than what we've taken now. Good luck. But um, now we're going to have a bit of a session on questions and answers and um, Anne is going to moderate that for us and, and make sure that we've got um, questions from you guys that we can answer. Thanks for those of you that have um, either sent your questions in through the chat or emailed Marilee your questions if it's, you're not able to do so through the chat. Um, I'll just go through those in order and we'll see, we'll try and get through um, as many as we can. Um, first of all, Fahim, here's one for you. Daryl asks, where does the National Emergency Risk Assessment Guidelines, or NIRAG, sit here, particularly with regard to standardising risk criteria for working with multiple stakeholders? So maybe if you could just give us a, a bit of a um, recap on where, what the, are the National Emergency Risk Assessment Guidelines and then answer the question. Yeah, so that's a really good question. When we start uh, uh, designing a risk assessment process in Coast Adapt, we strategically decided to st not to create something new. We wanted to stay as close as possible to any existing uh, risk assessment processes, such as uh, ISO 31000 risk assessment uh, uh, principles and guidelines. And NERAG is also uh, based on ISO 31000, so we are quite well aligned with NERAG and other uh, risk assessment process. We're, we have also uh, identified at the state level uh, risk assessment and uh, adaptation guidelines and mm -hmm. Coast Adapt's guidelines are well aligned with them as well. Mm -hmm. So the overall process is quite similar, well aligned, but when you look into the details that what sort of scale I should use, what sort of uh, criteria should I use for uh, risk assessment? We provide some example. We adopted some of those from different guidelines, from NERAG or from uh, some other state government guidelines. So we provide them as an example. But advice is to uh, modify them and change them and adopt them based on your circumstances. So if you have any uh, particular thing, if you're using already NERAG in your organization, uh, advice is stay, stick to that and use mm -hmm. our templates along those guidelines. To supplement. Yeah. Okay. So Dave, Mark asks, how regularly do you think adaptation plans and strategies should be reviewed? That will often depend on the scale of the plan, who's involved and um, and what where they are where people are up to. I, I think they should be reviewed fairly regularly um, and because you've identified thresholds of what uh, of when you're going to take actions but you've also got um, your own indicators of performance and hopefully your plan is being implemented. So sometimes um, your plan may not be implemented, your, your plan may be a plan that says we're not going to do anything right now and we are going to look at this again in five years time. So as many times as you can have time bound actions within your plan will help you to review that. But it's a continual thing and, um, it, and your plan should be fit for the purpose of your organisation. And so if you are reporting through your, your organisation's um, structures, um, you should try and get the timing of your plan so you can report regularly on this to your higher people in your organisation. It's important that, that the plan is owned throughout the organisation and through this regular reporting and review, engaging with people and making subtle changes, you can get that plan to live. And if your plan can live and can be accepted, then it's more likely to achieve the outcomes. Thanks, Dave. Um, this is more a procedural question from Francis. He just wants to make sure he's had connectivity problems from where he's um, listening in uh, West Africa. So yes, we will um, have all of these, uh, um, the webinar available on the, um, the CoastDAP page or the, the NCAF page. And um, we will respond to questions by emails after the after the um, the webinar too. If you have any follow up questions, um, the Tamar NRM from Launceston Group asks, and this is one for me, dealing with maladaptive ideas from stakeholders where they impact on other sectors. 
Sometimes excluding the idea can mean alienating the stakeholders, your thoughts. So often with these wicked problems, um, as I said in the beginning, you know, everyone's got a different understanding of the problem, different understanding about the causes, different understanding about what the, what the potential solutions are. And often, often these sort of solutions um, aren't, going to be, aren't going to be the right ones, but hopefully the solutions that the community comes up with can fit into a broader, a broader suite of solutions. But some of the ideas you're just going to have to reject outright. Um, and that's always going to be difficult. Um, however, it's shown, there's a lot of research around to show that if people are included in the process, then they're able to deal with outcomes that don't necessarily suit them. So if you've got a transparent and effective engagement process, then it's easier to deal with people's ideas not being included or being outright rejected. So that's kind of a very simple answer um, that you know really doesn't do justice to kind of the complexity of what's involved. You need to ensure that you have processes that um, for dealing with conflict um, in your in your communication and engagement processes, and that re might require some expert help. But certainly going, certainly if you're trying to build trust with your community and trying to be inclusive. You can't accommodate everyone's ideas, so you're going to have to work out how you're going to deal with that, and it's it's not simple. So, yeah, that's that's um, that's a start to answer that question question um, from Tamar. So Bob asks if we have climate risks other than just coastal related, such as fire, heat, and wave problems, can we still use Coast Adapt? Does this mean it can be useful for non-coastal councils? Yeah, look, absolutely. Um, as I, um, I think we said earlier on, it's really important that we consider all of the risks when we're doing, um, when we consider, when we're developing up our adaptation plans, because otherwise we might make a really good decision to avoid wave action, but it might be a really bad decision from a perspective of bushfire or, or, or some of the other drivers. So really important that we consider all of those. And as far as using Coast Adapt beyond the coast, we certainly believe that at least 50% of the Coast Adapt information, of the Coast Adapt tools, are useful wherever you are. It's really the, some of the, 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 the technical guidance, some of the data, and some of the case studies that are very specific to the coast. But things such as CCADs, you can use um, beyond the coast very easily, the communication guidance, the, the risk assessment guidance, and a lot of other information within it is very, very useful beyond the coast. Great. John says his organisation is mostly focused on planning for the next 10 to 15 years. Why should he be thinking about longer timescales? For him or...? Both of you, either of you. Okay, well, um, because climate change is happening and um, while you're planning for the next 10 to 15 years, what are you planning for? If you're building something like a house, a piece of infrastructure, it's likely that they'll last for a lot longer. So we often hear people say that houses are built for 30, 40 year horizons, and yet you drive around the Australian coast, you find houses that are over 100 years old. And that's probably going to be the, the likelihood of, of how we work into the future. So it really does depend on what our issue is and, and, and how long we need to plan for. And so it doesn't mean that the actions have to be intensive. It may be that we're doing something that's got a 5 to 15 year horizon and we do a risk assessment and we find that we're not going to be affected by climate change in that particular period of time. So we, that, it allows us to continue in, on your, as bus, with business as usual. But we might put some sort of um, stage into our thought process, into our risk plan, into the way we report risk and say in 10 years time or in 5 years time we will redo our risk assessment and just make sure that what we're doing is on track. I can add a little bit with that. Uh, if, if, for example, if you are from a council and if you, you in the next 10-15 years you probably will be uh, building new assets and when you are building those it's important to consider what those assets lifespan will be. So if your life asset, if you are building something in the next 10, 15 years, and the design life of those assets are 50 years, so any decision that you make next 50 years will stay beyond that. So it's important 
from this perspective. Another uh, perspective is uh, if you're maintaining your existing assets for within next 10 to 15 years, if your, some of the, your assets might be due for renew within that particular period of time. So what decision you make on that about the renewal, how you renew those assets will also be important. So that's why it's important to consider climate change within even within a short period of time. Great. Look, um, I think it's time for our audience to be able to go back to do their normal jobs. Um, and we've taken up all their time. Look, thank you all very much for participating with us on this um, webinar. I hope you've got something useful out of it and, uh, and enjoyed it. Um, we will be putting the videos up onto our Facebook and YouTube sites um, within a couple of weeks. And we'd encourage you to share these with your colleagues who might not have been here today or, who, or even watch them again yourselves if you think you might get something um, out of them again. Um, Coast Adapt is there. It will be supported going forward over the next few years. So it's a resource that you can trust and we do encourage you to go in and use it um, and get back to us through the NCAF email address if you have any um, questions and challenges that you would like um, to, to know more about. So we appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, thanks very much to Fahim and Anne for their input. Um, and um, yeah, thank you all very much.